Welcome everyone to OSNAP. OSNAP is a monthly gathering um, uh, reserved for women, trans, uh, gender non-conforming folks. Um, we created this space in 2017 to um, uh, create a, a safe and generative conversation around art and art making. Um, and today we are going to um, talk about copyright. We are so honored to have Thomas Madry, who is the general counsel and general counsel and head of national content and education for the American Society of Media Photographers, ASMP. Madri has a unique background. He was a professional commercial and fine art photographer who became an attorney and built a law firm specifically to serve the needs of content creators. His firm's clients have included visual creators, fine artists, performing arts organizations, collectors, galleries, archives, museums, and other creative individuals and groups. Additionally, Madri regularly briefs the US Supreme Court and other courts around the country on issues affecting creatives with a focus on copyright and licensing issues. He holds a BA in commercial photography from the Brooks Institute, a bachelor's of business administration from the University of Texas at Dallas and a law degree from SMU. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Copyright Alliance and the Dallas Opera among others. Wow, okay. Um, welcome, Thomas, and uh, we are super excited to have you here today. Well, I, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you for, for reaching out um, and, uh, and getting this all set up. I'm very, uh, as, as we were just doing introductions a second ago, and I was writing down the list of, um, the list of topics, it, it is a long list and a list that I think all creators need to know. And so I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, by the end of today, you'll at least take one or two things away um, <clears throat> that you can utilize in, in, uh, in your work and in your efforts. Um, I'll, give, I'll give just a, a touch of history. I think two things uh, I found of, of interest. One, I was born in Philadelphia um, and lived there till I was about 10 before we ended up moving to, uh, to Texas. Um, and uh, I moved away from Texas for about 15 years, but um, I'm back here now in, in Dallas uh, where I've been for, for quite a while. And, um, and so I, I, I certainly enjoy, um, enjoy Pennsylvania, enjoy Philadelphia. So I was, I was excited, I was excited to see that. Um, I'm gonna jump into a whole, a whole bunch of things but I want to uh, initially talk about ASMP real quickly. If you haven't heard of ASMP, we're a 77-year-old uh, trade association, one of the oldest trade associations focused on photography and visual creation. And um, what, what we do is, is help artists and creatives It said I was muted, so I, I unmuted, I unmuted. Um, uh, maintain their businesses, create their businesses and protect their rights. And that's really the goal. And I know that today we wanna to talk a lot about copyright issues and then very practically how some of those uh, apply to the questions that you have. Um, now, I'll, I'll give a little, kind of a little five to 10 minute um, uh, base of copyright um, law here at the beginning because it, it permeates through all the different topics that, um, that were mentioned. And I guess the first thing that I always like to think of when I think of copyright is that copyright law is embodied in the original constitution. And I say original because it's not even an amendment. Copyright law is in the actual document. It, uh, copyright law has been with us since the founding of, of the country, and it's based on laws that came from the 1500s and 1600s. Um, and the idea of copyright is this. If you are a creator and what you create today, tomorrow someone could come and take and put their name on it and sell it, well, then you would have no incentive to create works 
in the marketplace, you couldn't survive. It wouldn't be a job, right? And so <clears throat> there's a balance to copyright law. And what copyright law says is we will give the creator a limited monopoly to do certain things for a certain period of time. And the creator is the only one who can do those things for that period of time. And when we say we own a copyright, that's what we're talking about. The rights that you have when you have a copyright are the rights to reproduce the work, display the work, distribute the work, perform the work, make derivative works. You know, these are things that only the copyright holder can do. And if anyone else does them without permission, they're infringing on a copyright, okay? Now, I said a second ago that, that copyright is limited, and that's because of the balance. On one side, we have the balance to allow the creators, give them an incentive to create. On the other side of the balance, we have the, the, the public good and good for society. And so copyright terms are limited. In the US, um, the term of copyright is the, is the creator's life plus 70 years. So your life plus 70 years. And that sounds and is like a long time. And you might say, well, what am I going to do with my copyright after I'm no longer alive? But copyright is a form of intellectual property. And the thing that I always like to remind people is that intellectual property is property, right? Just like if I'm driving down your street and I see your car there and I say, you know what? I like that car, I'm just gonna go take it. And I take your car and then you catch me and you say, hey, you, you just stole my car. And I say, oh, it's okay here, you can have it back. I can't do that. I can't do that with copyrights either. I can't say to you, hey, I just borrowed your photograph and I'm gonna use it and, and then you caught me, so I'm gonna give it back, right? Because intellectual property is property. And I think if I'll start with one of the most important things that I want everyone to know. And in, in, the, in my presentations that I give, I normally have this big slide and it says the most important rule of copyright. And this applies to everyone who creates works, no matter what type of works they are, photographs, paintings, quilts, anything, right? Um, and that is that th the minute that you create a work, you own, and have a copyright in that work. What that means is that you don't have to tell anyone, you don't have to fill out a form, you don't have to do anything. When I press the shutter on my camera or on my phone, or I write the words on the page or whatever the things, the, whatever the steps I do to complete creating a work, I own a copyright at the moment of creation, at the moment of creation. So each one of us here undoubtedly owns hundreds of thousands of copyrights, because if you are doodling something on a piece of paper at the moment, you own a copyright in that, right? If you have taken a picture ever in your life, you own a copyright in that. No one, you don't have to tell anyone, you own it, which means that you are the only one that's allowed to reproduce, distribute, display, perform. You're the only one who can do those, those exclusive rights for your life plus 70 years. Okay. Now we've had some questions and I'm going to go over a lot of the details on things like copyright registration, right? Well, if we own the copyright, why do we have to tell anyone? What is this thing about registering with, with the government and why should we do that? And we're going to talk about, you know, well, what about social media? You, you just said that I'm the only one who can do this. Does that mean that you know when other people do it, they're infringing? We're going to talk about fair use, which has come up a couple times. What about when uh, I see a, a photograph that, or I see an image that I create an image that is based on an image that was in a film, or I rephotograph something? I know we had some questions about that, and that falls into this category of fair use. Um, uh, I, I have my list here, and before I hop into the list, I want to, uh, can I share my screen real quickly? Okay, so I'll come back to this at the end, uh, but all of the questions that you've asked, 
last October, ASMP launched something, and it was the reason that I closed my law firm to come work at ASMP full time. And my law firm at its height had six attorneys and you know an equal number of support staff, and we we're doing a lot of work around the country. And, and I decided to close that firm so that I could work for ASMP, primarily so I could create this platform called the ASMP Academy. The ASMP Academy is a member benefit. And at the ASMP Academy, we have hundreds of hours of video and tutorials and everything else. And I'm going to quickly show it to you because I'm going to refer to it as we as we talk about some of the things today. So I'm going to share my screen real quickly and just go over one or two um, uh, one or two things here. Sorry, one second. If you are an ASMP member, you have access to the Academy. Last week, I mean, literally last week, uh, we announced that um, Sony is, is now the sponsor of the ASMP Academy and it's the largest sponsorship that um, an organization like, like Sony has ever done with a trade association on an education platform. We're very excited about it. Um, and so up here, if you go to courses and curriculums, you'll see a curriculum that's called the ASMP Core Copyright Curriculum. And in the ASMP core copyright curriculum, we have five courses, each about one to two hours long, copyright essentials, copyright registration, advanced copyright topics, where we talk about fair use, the DMCA, where we talk about takedown notices, how to put this all together. We also have things, videos on copyright publication and history and work for hire, which I'll mention, and fair use. But that's just one of a whole bunch of things that are here. We have courses on incorporating anti-racism into your creative business taught by our DEI consultant, Brandon Campbell. Uh, we have contracts, agreements, and licensing, which is part of another curriculum called Path to the Profession, which, are, which is designed for people who are getting into the business or who just need a refresher. Um, formations and foundations, which talks about setting up an LLC, all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to show you one other thing, um, uh, and that is our document library, because I am going to refer to this. And in our document library, we have 20 something, um, uh, 25 plus guides. Here are talent releases and model releases, um, you know, property releases, which we'll mention here in a second, COVID-19 documents. A couple of people are talking about social media licenses, video licenses, assumption of risks, works made for hire, takedown notices, bills of sale if you're doing fine artwork. All of those I've rewritten in the last six months. So in my private practice, if you were to come to me and say, hey, hey, create those 25 documents for me, it would cost a ridiculous amount of money. And they're all there for ASMP members. Um, I'm really proud of the Academy. I think it's really amazing. I bring it up because in the hour that we have here, I am going to be able to touch on only the, the barest surface level of the topics that were listed. All of those topics, everyone that every question that was asked in the introductions is described in a lot of detail in the academy. The last thing I'll say about that is ASMP members and by the way, ASMP members do not have to be photographers. We have painters, we have sculptors, we have filmmakers, we have musicians, we have everyone who cares about content creation. Um, ASMP members have the opportunity to meet with me one-on-one -on -one for 15 minutes every Tuesday morning. Um, there's, there's 10 or 12 slots every Tuesday and I sit down with ASMP members via Zoom and we talk about their particular issues. And that's been incredibly fun for me. We just started that a few months ago. So I would love for everyone to be an ASMP member. Um, and student membership is $45 all the way up to our professional level memberships, which are $335 a year. But all of the memberships get full access to the Academy, which is the hundreds of hours of videos that I just showed you. All right, that's the sales pitch. Let's get into the content. Um, so I'm gonna jump around a little bit. And as I cover a topic, um, at the bottom, I think everyone has a, like a raise hand button in zoom, or if you want to hop into chat or whatever you want to do, I'm going to just kind of, cause I don't, 
I didn't have everyone's name with the topic that um, that they were discussing. So I'm going to talk about a topic. And then if we have some follow up questions, I'm more than happy to take them. I'm not probably going to be able to get to everything that that we discussed, but I'm going to hit the, the high points. And I'm going to start with um, this idea of registration, because I spent all that time at the beginning saying that copyrights are are yours from the moment of creation right but then i talk about this second step about registration now if you want to enforce your copyrights if you want to prevent someone from doing something with your works that's unauthorized and you want to prevent them from doing that in court for example then you will need to have your copyright registered. But there's a, a important understanding about what registration is and what it does. If you're a photographer, you can register up to 750 images that you've taken on one registration form for $55, okay? And there's a lot of nuance there. And you saw there's a whole set of courses on copyright registration. And so I'm not going to be able to go into to all the details. But my point about registration is this. Why would we want to do it? Let's just answer that question. Even though you own the copyright, by registering it with the US Copyright Office, you allow yourself to be eligible for what we call statutory damages. Because a lot of times when people steal our work or infringe our work, and we see it somewhere that we didn't authorize it, it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like Walmart stole it and put it on a t-shirt. It's like, you know, someone put it on their blog. It's still not okay, but it's not something that is, you know, financially, you know, damaging. But copyright law has this thing in it called statutory damages, which says, if you have registered your copyright prior to the infringement, then you, the copyright owner, are eligible for up to $150,000 per infringement if the work is registered before the infringement. Now, I am a lawyer that wants to keep people out of court. But if you find someone who is stealing your work, you have a much bigger ability to get them to stop if you have the law on your side and the penalty is, is a whole lot of money, they'll pay more attention, right? Very few things actually go to court. And so what I want you to remember about copyright registration is that if you're a photographer, registering your copyrights before they're infringed is one of the simplest and easiest forms of insurance that you can have because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's a, you know, there's a number of great examples, but there's a case that I'm very intimately involved with, and it's the case of photographer Lynn Goldsmith versus the Andy Warhol Foundation. And um, Lynn Goldsmith is an ASMP member, and this all uh, stems, there's a lot of videos I have out there about this case. We've written briefs on this case at all the different levels. But what this case is about is, is about licensing and can an artist use a photograph and what level and what amount. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about fair use in a moment. Point being, by registering your copyrights before the infringement takes place, you leave yourself open to no matter what happens in the future, knowing that you can protect yourself and your work. Copyright registration is really important. But it's something that requires, you, you, well, let me say it this way. You don't need a lawyer. It's meant to be done yourself, okay? Um, it is a simple online process. The first time or two you do it may be a little confusing. Uh, but, um, you know, like at the Academy, we do a uh, copyright registration and, and we just do it live. Um, uh, I, I go through the entire process for photographs. Now, it's a little different for paintings. It's a little different for music. Photography is the only medium that has that 750 image 
uh, capacity. For every other group, you can do up to 10 unpublished works on one application. This is something we're looking to change. And I do a lot of work with the Copyright Office and we write, you know, propose laws and drafts on things. And we say, look, painters shouldn't be limited to 10 while photographers can do 750, right? We want everyone to, to be able to register their works um, uh, freely. I can talk more about that if there are questions. My point being, if you are serious and focused about protecting your copyrights, then you should really be thinking about how you're going to incorporate registration into your work. But remember, registering has nothing to do with whether or not you own a copyright. A lot of times I hear people say, well, I'm going to go copyright my work with the US Copyright Office. Nope, you're going to register the copyright you already own. All of us already own our copyrights. And that's an important piece to remember. Um, and so we've, and, and after I do like two more topics, we'll take a little minute and then we can ask, answer questions and ask questions and I'll jump into the next set because I know there's just a lot of stuff going on, but I want to hit what I can. Um, I talked about the rights that are in a copyright. I talked about the right to reproduce, distribute, display, make derivative works, all that kind of stuff, right? But there's a whole nother set of rights out there. And they're rights that a lot of people kind of, kind of merge into copyright, but they're totally different. And these are rights of privacy and rights of publicity, okay? And you saw the section in the academy in the document library that were talent releases and property releases. And talent releases, and, and you will hear often um, talent releases called model releases. Um, that's what they were generally called in the past, but we call them talent releases. Talent releases are not about copyright at all. Talent releases are about a person's right of privacy and right of publicity, because every person has the right to control how their name, image, and likeness is used in the world and in a commercial sense. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna be able to, to deal with two questions with this one topic. And the two questions that we had at the beginning were about street photography and about um, musician photography. Actually, I think there are three questions we can talk about here because there was, I think, an album cover as well that, that we, were, we were mentioning at the beginning. Because I can take a picture of a celebrity, and this actually has come up in the news a lot, and it comes up regularly. I think the last person that this came up with in a prominent way was Ariana Grande. And if I take a picture of Ariana Grande, remember the person who owns the copyright at the minute of creation is the photographer who presses the shutter. So if I take the picture, I am 100% the copyright owner. The subject or anyone else has no claim to the copyright at all without, without any kind of caveat. I own the copyright, but sometimes that's not enough because what the subject of the photograph owns is the right of publicity of their name, image, and likeness. And if they haven't waived that right, if they haven't signed a release, and what the release does, and if we have time at the end, I can go show you some of these releases if it would be helpful and interesting. Um, what the release does is it says, hey, I know you're taking a picture of me and I authorize you, photographer, to use this picture for marketing purposes, promotional purposes, advertising purposes, whatever it is. So when you are getting a release from someone, what you're, what you're really doing is getting them to waive their right of publicity. It has nothing to do with copyright. Okay. You own the copyright. Now, this works in reverse as well. What I mean by that is, if I take a picture of Ariana Grande 
And Ariana Grande likes it. And she sees it on my Instagram profile. And she says, wow, that's an amazing picture of me. And then she takes it and uses it on her Instagram profile. She's committed copyright infringement against me. Because remember, I'm the one who owns the copyright. She may own the right to publicity for her name, image, and likeness, but I'm the one who owns the copyright, right? So when do you need a release? When can the person who's in the photograph prevent you, the copyright owner, from using the photograph? And here there's a big gray area, but we kind of know the, the sides of the gray area and then the middle is where it's the most gray. And if you are doing something that is purely fine art, for example, let's say I took my picture of Ariana Grande and I hung it in a gallery. That is something that I can always do. And that fine art print is not something that the subject could say could prevent me from doing in almost every circumstance. I can always do that. Fine art gets a lot of protection in the law. But what if I said, hey, um, uh, Target, this is a great picture of Ariana Grande. Uh, if you pay me 10 grand, I'll, I'll give it to you and you can use it for all your advertising stuff. Well, then Ariana Grande could say, you are commercially exploiting my name, image, and likeness, and I didn't give you permission, so no. So those are kind of the two ends, right? We have pure fine art over here and we have pure commercial over here. But what about the middle? And so let me give you an example of what's in the middle. Let's say I have my picture of Ariana Grande in a gallery show, but I use that image on the invitation to the gallery show and on a Facebook ad talking about the gallery show. And now all of a sudden, it's not just an image in a gallery show, it's an advertisement for the show, right? That is more likely to be considered a commercial use. And commercial use is where we need those releases, okay? Let's bring this back to two questions that we had. One, the album cover related issue. If you take a photograph of someone and they want to use it on an album cover, that is a, a use where you will license the work to them so that they can use it on their album cover. Obviously, there's no right of publicity issue there, right? Because they want to use it. They're the ones that are using it commercially. But what you're doing is you're granting them a license, and we'll talk about licenses here in a moment. You're granting them a license to use the work because you're the copyright owner, which means they can't display, reproduce, or distribute your picture without your permission. So you're saying, yes, I own it, and yes, I'm giving you permission, okay? So there's one case. Here's another case, street photography. The general rule is that if you are in a public place taking pictures of other people in public places, you do not need releases unless it's, it's a commercial use, okay? Which means almost always, I could do street photography and then have a gallery show of my street photography. And I could have a hundred prints and there could be, you know, 50,000 people that see it every day. That's not a commercial use. But for that one, let's say I make a book, right? That's fine. But for that one image that's on the cover of the book, if you can get a release, I would say go get a release, right? Because things that are the covers, things that are the advertisements, things that are like that are can be considered more commercial, okay? All right, now I'm going to give two sentences on licensing and then we're going to take a break because I'm in not a break, but a question break because I feel like I covered a lot of stuff in a little bit of time. So there may be some questions. Um, 
And if there are no questions, whenever there are no questions, I always think that I either did really well or really bad. So I'll be interested to see how we did here. Um, licensing. We've talked about copyright, which is a right someone owns. We've talked about rights of publicity, which is also a right that someone owns. Here's what a license is. When I own something, I can allow someone else to use it in exchange for anything, right? I could say, uh, Lori, you can use the image to promote this class. In exchange, you have to send me um, a pound of goldfish food, right? That's a license. You can use, I'm giving you the right to use something I own in exchange for something else. As an aside, that's a contract. We have a course on contracts, assignments, and licensing, agreements and licensing, and, and assignments and or contracts. And the lawyer uh, who's in the group here will, will be intimately familiar with what we learn in the very first week of law school, which is contracts have three parts, right? Offer, acceptance, and consideration. And every contract in the world just has those three parts. And when we talk about a license, when we talk about an agreement, when we talk about a release, all of those are just types of contracts and they all have an offer and acceptance and consideration. Again, in the academy, hours on that stuff. So all a license is, is me saying, there are rights that I own that I'm going to, there are rights that I own exclusively that I'm going to allow you to use, to, to, to utilize in exchange for whatever we agree on. A lot of times that's money. Sometimes it's credit. Hey, you can use my photograph, but you have to give me credit, right? Or sometimes it's very complex, meaning a lot of the licenses that we write are things like, you can use this photograph in one version only, in North America only, for social media use only, for a period of one year, and if you want to use it in print advertising or if you want to use it in any other medium, then we have to renegotiate our license, right? License agreements can be one sentence or 100 pages. But all licenses at its core is you allowing someone else to use something that you own. Think of it like a rental car, right? I have a car, you want to use the car, I'm going to allow you to use the car if you give me money. What that means is that during the period that we've agreed upon, I'm not going to call the police and say, you stole my car, right? We have agreed that you are allowed to do that. You are allowed to take my vehicle for this period of time in exchange for money. But what if I keep it an extra week after I told you I was going to return it? Well, now I've stolen your car. Same thing with photography. If I license an image for you to use on your website for a year, and I look and two months after that year passes, you're still using it. You've infringed on my copyright. You've violated the exclusive rights of that you get when you own a copyright and you've committed infringement and I can now sue, right? Obviously we don't wanna get there, but that's the truth. Now, after we, um, we're gonna stop now and I'm gonna answer any questions that we have. And then we're gonna talk about how all this ties into social media. We're going to talk about fair use um, and because those things go together. And then I want to talk about the nonprofit issues as well. Um, and, and then we'll take another kind of question break. So that was a lot of stuff, but I am more than happy to take questions. And maybe, uh, Lori, you can um, uh, either look at the questions in the chat or help facilitate just uh, so that, you know, if people raise their hands or whatever the case is, I, I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah, we have one one hand raised already. Claire, you wanna ask your question, please? Uh, yes, um, this came up because in a small photography group I'm in, someone was taking pictures of people, um, and I won't, <clears throat> won't say the theme, but this, the, um, taking a picture in public came up versus taking a picture in a business. And I know that 
you know, office buildings and such like that can be considered private, but this was in a coffee shop or other places that essentially a business is where she took some of the pictures and the question came up, this is considered still considered a public place. Yeah, so, so a lot of the law, the answers you'll get from lawyers uh, include the phrase, it depends. And I try not to say that, but here's what I will say. If the question is, is not necessarily about whether it's a public place or not, that is important. The question is about whether the person has an expectation of privacy in that place. Okay. So good example would be if I go to a coffee shop and anyone can come in the coffee shop, there's no limitations and there are windows there it would be a hard sell for me to say that I have an expectation of privacy the same way that I would if I were in my home, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so in the example that you gave, it's probably okay that mm -hmm. you don't have a release for that, even though the business is private, because the group or the person or the thing that could exercise the right would be the business itself. The coffee shop could say, hey, this is private property. You need to stop taking pictures. But someone else who's in the coffee shop can't say, hey, this is private property if they have no relationship to the private property owner, right? Okay. So, and the other thing that I would, I would mention is to think about the reverse, which is, I think we can all agree that government land is public property, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, we're not talking about like sensitive, sensitive military things. We're talking about just like, you know, government, you know, land is, is public property by law, but that doesn't mean that I can go into a bathroom on government property and take pictures because even though that's public property, there's an expectation of privacy. So, it's real easy, and I did this, to say public property and private property, but the second level analysis is, is what is the expectation of privacy for the person who's there? And in the coffee shop example, it's unlikely that that person has an expectation of privacy. So unless you're using the work for commercial purposes, it's also unlikely that you would need to obtain a release in that situation. So. Thank you. Next is Laura. Hi. Yeah. First of all, I'm really glad to know that what I did when I licensed my photograph for the album cover, I did correctly. <laughs> but the question I have is I do fine art photography. So when I photograph something, I manipulate it a lot. So it, I make a derivative of the original. If I want to register my images, do I register the original or the derivative? And sure. if I, I it, because I now I'm using some older photographs and I'm making different things with them. So I'm a little question, so, what do I do? It's a great question. And this will lead a little bit into some of our fine art uh, or some of our fair use uh, discussion in a second. But since it's about registration, let me specifically answer this. And that is, we want it. lawyers have an annoying way to take words that we think we know what they mean in real life and make them mean something different. And a great example is publication, which means nothing like we think it means when we talk about it in copyright law. My point here is that a derivative work is a very specific term. And so what I want you to think about is not using that term, but using what you started with, which is you alter and change and adjust and transform works. Right, right, that's better. <laughs> but if there are works that you own, if I go take a picture today and I register it with the US Copyright Office, Mm -hmm. And then over the next year, I change the color. Maybe I make it black and white and maybe I remove a tree here or there and maybe I change it around. But the, the 
the work that ends up after a year looks looks similar to the work that I did, it's very unlikely that you would need to re-register the work. Okay. You, now, if you then take your work, but you composite it with a number of other images, and so that final image looks nothing like the original source images, then you would want to register that work as a separate work. But just changing uh, some things here and there does not create an entirely new work if you own the original, meaning that every time you change something, you don't have to re-register. You really only have to register once, the underlying work, unless it's massive changes, okay? Um, so I don't know if that answered completely, but I hope that made a little sense. I mean, I, I'll do things like I shoot with Polaroid a lot. And I these particular works I'm thinking of, I combined two Polaroid pictures on top and the bottom, and then I manipulated them. Yeah. So do I have to register that work or can I just keep it to the original two Polaroids I took? <laughs> I, I would say that um, if you're compositing multiple images, that are very different that the the resulting works you should probably register separately okay. um uh but if you have registered the underlying works that uh -huh. gives you a lot of protection even if you didn't in the future even if you didn't re-register that thing in the future okay. um but the question to me in that in that what you're asking my question to ask is would a person looking at this work think that this is just an evolution of the original or this is a brand new thing if if a normal person would think this is a brand new thing then you should probably register it as a brand new thing and can i just ask a real quick question again <laughs> sorry is what about i uh, the idea of it has to be unpublished what does that mean or published or unpublished? So um, so the way I start my talks about publication, the sentence I always use is that there is no single more confusing issue in all of copyright law than whether something is considered published or unpublished yeah. <laughs> based on based on you know what the copyright office says. So I'm not going to dive too far into it, but I will give a brief, a brief description of published versus unpublished here, which is to say the Copyright Office considers something published if you have made the work available to the public for purposes of further display or distribution or have made it available to a group of persons, even if the, the focus is not on further display or distribution. Now, in the Academy, I have a whole video that's about 45 minutes on publication. Um, and it's, it's a tricky area of law, but here's what I want you to think of if you have to have like, a, like the baseline understanding. If you've put your work out into the world, you should probably consider it published, mm -hmm. okay? Now that is not a hard and fast rule. There are a lot of exceptions to that, but if you've never put your work out in the world, it's unpublished, right? There, the, let's let that for the moment be the dividing line, even though there are a lot of other details around, around that. For example, I can put a work in a gallery and a hundred million people can come and view that work and it is considered unpublished, okay? But if I put the work on my website mm -hmm. and zero people come and see the work, it is considered published, mm -hmm. right? So it's not about access, it's not about, it's, it's about this weird set of rules that, are just confusing. 
and, and obviously we don't have time to jump into it today. But what I would say is very confusing. If you put your work out into the world and you're attempting to sell it or license it or distribute it or anything, it's likely considered published. Thank you. We're going to go to the next question because there is a queue. Uh, Patricia, Aaron Zong. Yeah, confusing when there are two Patricias. Thanks. Um, my question is um, when doing like street photography or, you know, public places, et cetera, are there specific rules around the images of children? Are children uh, more protected than adults in these situations? So this is where I will remind people that we live in, in a country where anyone can sue anyone for anything, okay? And that's an important distinction because even if the law allows you to do something, that doesn't mean you won't get sued over it, okay? Um, and this is where I will give uh, some real life examples. I, my primary, um, my primary job when I was a photographer was a nature and wildlife photographer. So I spent months in Alaska leading workshops and, you know, that's going all over the world and doing cool nature and wildlife stuff. And when I, before I would go on a trip, I would take my equipment and I would go practice and I would practice in local parks and things like that. And I, um, was, um, uh, uh I had the police called on me a number of times and I am a large white male, right? Photographing people out in the world. And um, uh, that was something that um, if there are kids involved, it amps up everything. From a legal perspective, the minors have an additional right to privacy, okay, that an adult may not have, but there is no hard and fast rule there. Mm. What I would say is this, to protect yourself, if you are working with minors in any capacity, it is a much better idea to attempt to get a release than if all of your subjects are, are adults, okay? okay. Um, rightly so, in many cases, People are concerned about people taking photographs of their children. I mean, that's, there's, there's a reason that people are concerned about that. The law does not necessarily make those same distinctions. And so this question is a little less about the law and a little more about what you should do as a proper business practice, right? Um, and, and so do minors have a heightened level of an expectation of privacy? I would say the answer is yes, but it's not a clear cut thing. If I'm a street photographer and I'm taking a picture of a, a, a park and there are children in the park, they don't have additional rights that the other people in the photograph, they don't have rights that the other people in the photograph don't have necessarily, right? because everyone's in a public place doing public things. It really becomes an issue if there's any kind of commercial use of, of the images at all, because then you're exploiting images for, for financial gain and that gets into a whole separate area. But to answer your question as directly as a lawyer can, I would say that again, it's a gray area issue, but you should be really, really careful with minors in the ASMP document library, we have special model and talent releases for minors, right? You have to have the parent or guardian sign as well. And, you know, then we also get into contractual issues about what in the law we call incapacity, the, that even if a minor signs a release, but a parent or guardian doesn't, that release is not valid if the minor doesn't want it to be valid. It's the type of contract that we call avoidable contract right it's not void on its face it's voidable which also is a weird a weird statement but um i would just say be additionally careful if you're photographing minors thank you thank you very much okay next is ursula 
Hi. So I need a bit of clarity around this. So if I take an image of, of a person in public with their consent mm -hmm. and then um, exhibit the image, sell prints of the image, do I need to have a model or talent release prior to sale of a printed image? Generally Is that considered not. Commercial. Okay. Generally not. That would not be committed, co considered commercial, even though you're selling it, which sounds weird, right? Right. But it, it selling a fine art print is not a commercial activity for purposes of right of publicity issues. Now, you said with someone's consent. Mm -hmm. And what that means to me is they would be willing to sign a model release if they had some level of consent. Mm. Now, model releases don't have to be complex. I use this great app on my phone called Easy Release. In Easy Release, you can put in all the model release language. So I take ASMP's model releases and I put it in the app. And then if I'm out photographing someone, they can sign it with their finger and they get an email copy of it and I have their signature and it takes three seconds and you know we're good to go, right? Um, even if you did not have consent, it is likely if you were in a public place that you could still make and sell fine art prints of the work and not run afoul of anyone's rights. Thank you so much. And one follow up with that. Do those same rules apply if I um, take an image? I do a lot of runway photography. So if I'm at a uh, runway show and I'm photographing the models in someone else's designs, do those same rules apply? So, so no, um, a runway show would be considered, there are a lot of people who have ownership there, including the rights to the fabrics and patterns and designs, even though fashion design is not a copyrightable art, which is mm -hmm. one of the last non-copyrightable arts, the actual designs are. Um, and so you would need a property release related to the uh, clothing. You would need a, um, a model release related to the, um, the model, but um, the reason you would need that there and not out in the world is because essentially what you're doing is photographing an employee of an employer and mm. you would need the permission of whoever hired the employee and if you had that then you could photograph it but to me that is more of a um that is a a different type of situation than street photography in a public place gotcha thank you so much i have a question on that what about what's the use of a press pass then for these um runway shows so a press pass essentially is is saying the organizers have said, you are allowed to, to photograph these things. They're giving you a license to do the things, right? And so you have permission to use the images that you take for editorial purposes, um, which means non-commercial purposes. I can put them in a newspaper, in a magazine, on an article, on a blog or something about that show. That's the license that you've been granted. Okay. But they haven't granted you a commercial license, meaning you can't take a picture with a press pass and then sell it to a fashion house for, you know, for use on a billboard, right? So that sidesteps all the issues of permission because they've given you permission by the, by, by the very fact they've given you a pass. So. Okay. And uh, is my own social media account, my Instagram considered commercial purposes if I have a press pass? So... So again, a little gray area, but generally not. Um, there's a exclusion that we like to have in writing, but even if it's not in writing, it sometimes exists. And that's a personal promotion and publicity exclusion. And so a lot of times if I license something to someone, I'll say, yes, you can use this for these purposes, but you agree that I can always use it for my portfolio and my website and things like that. Now, could you then start selling the work? That's that's more gray area, but could you use it in your portfolio or on your site about things that you've done or on your social media? 
that's that's safer. That's safer. Um, okay, so uh, Ellen has a question, and I want to make sure we get to fair use because um, that will be uh, our, our next big yeah. lines to follow up with the uh, press pass. Um, which thank you, Lori, for doing that. So if I am at a music venue and I have a press pass to shoot, and then I utilize, I give the newspaper whoever gave me the press pass the venue what they need. They're my pictures, I own them, correct? Mm -hmm. So moving forward, if I utilize the work for fine art, which is often what I do, do I need a release from the, those people that I've shot and created? And then you mentioned mm -hmm. something about a, if you make up a card and it has one of those uses, then I ultimately have to get a release. I can't, I'm not matching the dots because I heard you say that if you make up a card, you need a release. So, so let me, let me give a, a very specific example. You go take a picture of a musical artist and um, the musical artist in Lynn Goldsmith's case was Prince, that, that, that was who she took a picture of. So you take a picture of Prince and you you had the right to be there, you had the press pass, you give it to the newspaper or whatever the case is, you can make fine art prints of that image without getting a release in, in the majority of situations, okay? That's generally gonna be just fine. By the way, just real quickly, the reason I, I keep saying things like the majority of situations, right of publicity laws are state specific meaning it's different in New York than it is in Texas than it is in Minneapolis than it, you know. So I'm giving you kind of the general rule. You always wanna check with your local attorney to get exactly the answers. But nine times out of 10, you can make a fine art print and sell it without getting a release from the person. What you can't do is start making t-shirts and selling them, okay? That is then more of a commercial use. Now, the gray area is, let's say you have a gallery show of your images of prints and you wanna send out an invitation and the invitation has a promo image on it. And, and the question then becomes, is that use of the image, which is now not really a fine art use, it's more of an advertisement use, you're advertising the show, right? Is that use of the image something that you need a release on? And it just gets dicier. Um, there isn't there isn't a clear answer there except to say that that use where you're advertising a show is more towards the commercial end than the images in the show which are more in the fine art end. And at some point you have to make a business decision, right? And the business decision is how likely is it that Prince is going to sue me over this? Okay. Um, and but all I'm bringing up is the fact that. Maybe the image on the invitation is okay, but maybe a Facebook ad promoting the show that goes to a hundred countries and is out there on the internet and it says, come to this show and buy this image would not be okay. And that's probably a fair distinction. If it's in a gray area, you just got to think about, is it more commercial or less commercial and where does it fall and how much risk am I comfortable with? I would, I, I would tell you, I would not be comfortable with the Facebook ad you can probably do the invite card if you send it to 200 people that you know that have worked with you before kind of thing. If you do a mass mailing of it to everyone in the county, then it is more commercial, right? Again, gray area stuff. And I, I wish I could be more specific. No, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> kind of where we are. Okay. That's it for the questions. We should go to fair use. Okay, cool. Fair use. This probably be where we're going to end um, for today. And again, um, we, I would love for every one of you to become an ASMP member. Um, it is, uh, I promise that uh, one, one download of one document pays for your membership <laughs> for the year. Um, my rate as a, as a lawyer was $5.50 an hour um, and professional membership is $3.55 a year, uh, $3.35 a year at ASMP. Fair use. I told you from the beginning that you only have, uh, that you are the only one that has the exclusive right to reproduce, distribute, perform, display works you own the copyright to. 
The exception is fair use. What fair use is, is it says the law and the courts have decided that there is a benefit to society, a benefit to society to allow people to create works that utilize existing works that are under copyright protection. Because we as a society want to promote creation and promote new works being made. So if I want to create a work that utilizes other works, I can argue that my use is what we call fair use under the law. And I'm going to go into what the, the facets are of fair use, but I want to kind of give you the overall idea. If a work is considered transformative, it is more likely to be considered a fair use. What does transformative mean? If you have given the work new message or new meaning that is different from the original underlying work, then it is more likely that it's been a transformed work. So there are some great examples of this. Um, uh, the famous Supreme Court case on this is Campbell versus A. Cuff Rose Music, which is about Two Live Crew. And Two Live Crew used a sample of uh, a Buddy Holly song. And the question was, did that use, was it commenting on the original? Was it creating something new? Was it transforming the original? Or was it simply just using the original in kind of the same way that it was used before, right? And here's what I will, here's what I will generally say. If, for example, I see your photograph online and I say, wow, that's amazing. And then I sit there and I draw your photograph. Right. I, I look at it, it goes through my eyes and through my hand and I draw it. And you can tell that my drawing is based on your photograph. That's likely going to be a fair use. And the reason that's likely going to be a fair use is it's not like I just took the photograph and used it. It went through a creative process and it was changed and transformed into the vision that I had for the, the underlying use. So if that photographer came and said, you stole my work, I would say, eh, no, that's, that's probably a fair use, okay. Here's another example. I don't know if you all have heard of the photographer, uh, Sherry Levine. Uh, she did a great series after Walker Evans, right? And uh, essentially re-photographed Walker Evans photographs such that her works and the original works were visually indistinguishable. I mean, they were literally visually indistinguishable, but Sherry Levine was commenting on, on the nature of art in relation to uh, uh, male dominated art and in photography and Walker Evans himself and was making a social commentary and critique on the works, okay? That, would likely be considered transformative use, even though if you put the images side by side, they look exactly the same. The example that I give here is this kind of theoretical philosophical argument, right? Let's say I own a gallery, I'm gonna take two minutes on this and then I'll move to the other part of fair use. Let's say I own an art gallery and I put up an image and that image is a red square. It's 12 inches by 12 inches, it's red. And uh, it is called, um, uh, and I forget the exact, um, the exact phrasing, this is from a wonderful book, um, but it's called I, I, Moses leading the Israelites, you know, out of the Red Sea or something, right? And then I feature another image. And the image is a red square that's 12 inches by 12 inches right next to it. And that image is called um, uh, Lamentations on how I felt when I saw uh, Moses leading the Israelites out of the Red Sea. Is that a transformative use? Have I given new message or meaning? And I think you can argue, yeah, that's a transformative use. Now, here's the third one. There's another red square next to it. And that red square is called my favorite part of my lament of seeing the red square, the red sea image, right? That's probably not a fair use 
because that is not giving new new comment is not creating social criticism all it's doing is taking a portion of the original and blowing it up a little bit right and so that's actually something that might not be considered a fair use and in this great philosophical experiment you can go around the room and have 12 images that look exactly visually indistinguishable and half of them might be fair use and half of them might not be right um so what i want you to think about fair use is is it transformative? Does it give the underlying work new message or meaning? Have things been changed or altered in a way that uh, makes the new work a whole uh, rather, than, rather than just a recitation of the original? Now let me talk about the law side. In the law, the only person who can tell you whether something is fair use is a court, which means that if you want to argue fair use and the other side says it's not, you're going to have to go to court to get an actual answer. No lawyer can tell you. What lawyers can tell you is this is more likely to be fair use or less likely. There are a few things in the law that, and this is in section 107 of title 17 of the, the US code, and that's the Copyright Act. Um, in the law, it says, certain things are more likely to be considered fair use. News reporting is almost always fair use, right? Things that are non-commercial, non-profit in nature are more likely to be fair use than not, but it's not a blanket rule. There have been plenty of nonprofits who have been sued for copyright infringement, and they say, well, it's fair use. We're a nonprofit. Nope, doesn't matter. The question is not whether you make money. The question is, how was the underlying work used, right? I often hear this myth, and it is a myth that says, well, if you use, you know, less than 10% of something, then it's always a fair use. Nope, that doesn't, that's not a thing. I could use 0.001% of something, and it could be considered an infringement. Or I can use 99.9% .9 of something, and it could be considered fair use. The whole percentage thing, total myth. And so when you go to court, the judge looks at four factors to determine whether something is fair use, okay? We're not going to get into all the details here because it's an interesting but long analysis. The first factor is the purpose and character of the use, and this is where transformative stuff comes in, okay? What is the purpose and character of the use? There are, the other factor I want to mention is factor four. Factor four is what is the impact on the market? of the use. And here I'm going to go back to the Lynn Goldsmith case. And what, what the, the court ended up finding in the Second Circuit, what the court ended up finding, is that uh, Andy Warhol Foundation said, well, look, Andy Warhol may have used Lynn Goldsmith's photograph, but it was a fair use because the market for an Andy Warhol is very different than the market for Lynn Goldsmith. And what Lynn Goldsmith said was no, because the issue here was about people who wanted to buy a photograph or an illustration of prints, right? And so I have my photograph of prints and you have your painting of prints. And if a magazine wants to buy one or the other, then they're competing against each other, which means the secondary use was impacting the market for the original. They were in the same market, okay? That makes it less likely to be fair use. Think of that in a more practical way. If you write a book and I take portions of your book, whole chapters, and I sell it as a book, then I am directly competing with the thing that, you know, that I, I took from. But if I look at your book and I take out a quote, and I write that quote on a canvas and I paint over it and I've now created a painting that's based on the quote, well, now someone might buy a painting or they might buy a book, but they're not competing in the same market, right? And so it's more likely to be a fair use if it doesn't have an impact on the market of the original. But all of that, factors two, three, and four, which we're not gonna get into, are in many cases rolled into factor one. And the main question, and this is not a hard and fast rule, but one of the main questions is, is the work transformative? When we talk about transformative works, we're talking about, did the use 
give the the new work different or new message or meaning than the original. If it did, then it's more likely to be a fair use. In the situation where I think someone was saying that they were they were photographing or rephotographing video clips and adding it and changing these things up, to me that sounds like it is a fair use. It's more likely to be fair use because you're creating new things. You're creating, you're adding visual elements and you're changing something from a video to a still and you're doing it within the framework of a vision that's giving it new message and meaning. That sounds a lot like more, more like fair use, right? Um, uh, versus me taking a video of a TV show and then going online and putting that video on my YouTube channel and, and then uh, let's say Game of Thrones, right? And then HBO says, hey, you just stole our video and put it up on your video platform to get people to look at it. That's not a fair use, right? That's just stealing. So fair use, again, it's all a gray area. But um, if you've given new message or meaning, it's more likely that it's considered fair use. Okay. Okay. So I see one question in the, in the chat. Um, uh, and I'm happy to answer that, Lori, if I can. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So it says, I have a friend who made a quilt featuring her hand-drawn images of a photograph of Rosa Parks with her lawyer, but she substituted an image she drew of Barack Obama. That quilt was used for the cover of a book and they were sued and settled. Always seemed fair use to me because it was adequately transformative is the difference that this was a published book. Okay, so here I would say this, it is almost certain that if the people went to court and went through the whole trial process, it would be considered fair use, okay? The, the issue is that the average fair use, the average copyright infringement case takes three years and costs $300,000 or more on average. And so a settlement may have been the appropriate and reasonable business and legal remedy. But if you're telling me that there's a photograph and that the photograph was transformed into a drawing, which was transformed to be part of a quilt, and people in the drawing were substituted with other people. I can't imagine something that would be more fair use than that. Now, that doesn't mean that a court wouldn't find it's not, but that's really towards the edge of what I would consider fair use. But again, to get there, to get someone to say this is fair use, you often have to spend a ridiculous amount of money to get a court to agree with you or not. Remember, anyone can sue anyone for anything, but that sounds like fair use. Okay. You know, um, I, know, I, I know we're at the end. Mm -hmm. um, if you do become an ASMP member, shoot me a line, drop me a line. Um, let me know what you wanna see. Let me know what you're interested in. Um, again, every Tuesday morning, I spend uh, eight or 10, uh, I meet with eight or 10 people, you can just sign up for a slot and we just chat about your issue for 15 minutes. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit longer uh, and answer more questions. I know um, uh, we're wrapping up, but I'm really appreciative uh, to be able to come and, and chat with y'all today. And I hope you picked up one or two things that might be useful. Uh Thomas, this, Tom, this was an amazing, amazing um, conversation. I can't thank you enough. I feel quite humbled by your generosity for sharing all that you know, or in 90 minutes. <laughs> um, I just, and I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, I, I are, oh, we have two questions. Do we have five minutes for two questions? Yeah. That, okay, yeah. let's just answer those questions um, and then we'll wrap. Uh, Patricia Aronsall. Okay. Hi. Um... Sorry, uh, my computer decided to die and I had to come back in. So, but I have, which may be more of a complex question. Um, and if it is just so, so, and I will join and talk to you in one of those time slots. As an amateur photographer, I took a bunch of photos of ruins in England, most of them national trust properties. And on their website, they say, you know, for commercial purposes, you need to buy their license, blah, blah, blah. If I want to use these images in an article, in a uh, sociology article, um, is that fair use? Okay, 
So well, it's complicated because it's international law. <laughs> yes. So one, it is complicated because it's international, but even more than that, it's complicated because national trust related issues, and I've dealt with a few of those in the UK, are unique. But I would say this, if the article is focused on an analysis and a critique of the work that you're talking about, it is more likely to be fair use under US law because what you're doing is, is you're, you're making commentary or criticism on something specific rather than an article that's about you know, rock formations and you happen to use this image just because it seems like you like it. That's not fair use, that's just infringement. But if you are writing about the specific thing that you're showing, then it's more likely that it is fair use. But again, the UK National Trust stuff is something you definitely would want to chat with a lawyer about. And I am not, um, I am not either licensed or a specialist in UK copyright law. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ursula. Ursula, do you have a question? I do, okay. sorry. So um, Thomas, you mentioned earlier on that um, copyright lasts for the creator's life plus 70 years. So as a creator, if I pass away, does my estate automatically retain the copyright or is that something that needs to be put in writing in a will, trust, something? So it is automatic, but the vast majority of people, including most estate lawyers, don't think about this. And, and so what I would say is this, the, the, the asset is like any other asset. So if you have a book at the time that you pass, that book is part of the estate automatically. If you have copyrights at the time that you pass, those copyrights are part of the estate, but almost no one thinks about this. What that means is that if you are a creator, either a hobbyist or a professional, I would have something written in my estate planning documents that talk about the intellectual property pieces that you may own, including all of your copyrights. Now, I work with a lot of photographers, a lot of artists who you know, will donate their, their works to universities or their archives in some way as they, as they reach those ages, um, because that allows them to have some control over what happens to their work. But as a, from a legal perspective, uh, copyright is an asset just like any other asset and becomes part of the corpus of the estate. But unless you've written it out, it's highly likely that everyone is going to just forget about it. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be written out, but I, but I do recommend that, that you, you do write it out. Thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, okay, we have one more question and then we're done. Um, we want to uh, make sure Thomas uh, gets his Saturday. Michelle? Yeah, just so fast the, the, about this one. The 1792 painting then, that's owned by um, an organization. Does that organization have any kind of special rights that they could assert, even though I guess, you know, the copyright would not yeah. be right? So, and, and, uh, not to not to go down a rabbit hole, um, but the the whole life plus seventy years thing only came about for uh, images or things that were created after January 1, 1978. Before 1978, you had a copyright term of um, of forty years, and then there were some extensions, and so there's a little weird area. But uh, universally. I cannot think of a reason that the painting you're describing from the 1700s would be under any kind of copyright protection at this point. Um, there, without knowing the exact specifics, I can't say there's there's nothing about it. But you know, uh, a good example is um, you know music, right? Um, and I am on the board of the Dallas Opera, and the opera deals with scores that were written in the 1700s those original scores are not under any kind of copyright protection. But if someone in the last 20 years re-recorded those things and changed it up a little bit, then that may be under copyright protection. In what you're describing though, I can't, I, I, I can hardly think of a situation where a painting from the 1790s would be subject to any kind of copyright protection or prevent you from using it in any kind of way. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I would love, you know, I, I know I've said thank you a, kind of a lot of times, but we really appreciate all you brought to our space. Yeah. Um, and you can tell in the chats that people are, are so grateful. Um, we hope to see you again. And congratulations on all you're doing for ASMP. It sounds like a critical, a critical asset that people can utilize. So um, it's, it's, a, it's wonderful to learn about. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And uh, and please, I put my email in the chat, magi at asmp.org. Feel free to reach out. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. Take care, everyone. See you in a month at OSNAP. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.